Okay. So we'll welcome everyone to February. February, uh, it's today what, the third? Yeah. Uh, one month is, is, has gone by. So I, I do want to ask, I'm hearing some I'm hearing some feedback. So if if you want to talk, uh, let let's all mute ourselves, and then if you want to talk, just unmute. And if, if some of you are using your uh, computers, you can just press the space bar, which is very easy. You don't have to look for that uh, unmute icon down there. Uh, but it, it does help with recordings uh, as well. Um, so we're we're halfway through the book of Revelation and uh, things are getting pretty weird. In fact, we're gonna probably embark on the most difficult chapter in the entire book uh, today. Well, we'll just probably get into the first two verses, uh, but things are gonna start to get pretty, um, you know, pretty scary if they haven't already. But one thing I want to remind you of, uh, and if you can think of the structure of the book and something that Kester talks about how, you know, this is a cycle that continues to come back on itself and it moves forward, but it, it reaches back and draws on images that have gone before. But the, there's a, a structure to the book that is very, um, the only way I can describe it is like, uh, is like the, uh, the Russian dolls. You know, those Russian dolls, you open up one and there's another Russian doll and then you open up another and there's another Russian doll. Uh, you know, we've seen John has a series of visions. First of all, he starts out with a vision of, you know, uh, God in God's glory and, uh, you know, this would, would Christ actually with the, with the sword. And this would have been chapter one. Uh, th then he's told, you know, to write these letters to these various churches. And then he's asked to come on up, you know, and now we're at the beginning of chapter, uh, four, I believe, you know, maybe it's five. Um, and he, he has a vision of the lamb opening, you know, a, a, a scroll with seven seals on it uh, that, you know, and we go through that. By the time we get to the seventh seal, uh, we have a new cycle that begins. And now it's the cycle of the seven trumpets. Uh, and I had a graphic for that last time. Um, uh, and this is, we, we're not really quite through all the trumpets yet, but we, we will be after today. But, but do you see that, that structure, you know, the, the first you had the seven seals and now we're looking at the second internal Russian doll, the seven trumpets. And we're eventually gonna look at another internal doll, which is gonna be, you know, the climax of it all. And that is the seven bowls, which will uh, bring the, the ultimate, uh, bring to ultimate fulfillment God's plan uh, for creation. Uh, but, you know, Jean was saying at the beginning of the class that, you know, she's tried to read this on her own. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's like reading somebody's dream, right? You, you, it made perfect sense to the person when he was having the dream. Uh, but, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to anyone else externally reading it. One thing that I've tried to do uh, throughout this, because this has been my learning experience in all of this, is, uh, you know, and, and Mac has pointed this out at, at just how thoroughly uh, immersed in Jewish culture John is. John of Patmos and Paul of, of Tarsus are really at, at two ends of the, the spectrum in terms of interpreting uh, who Jesus is. Uh, John is thoroughly Jewish. Paul is going to make some caveats to the Jewish law uh, and is, is going to try to offer a new interpretation of what uh, salvation means, salvation through grace. But John has all of this imagery and uh, the temple imagery being probably the most uh, uh, explicit. But part of my learning experience in this, after having taught Hebrew Bible and New Testament, uh, for 20 years at Hastings College, you know, every, you know, twice a year for 20 years, uh, you get to know the Bible pretty well. I mean, uh, I'm not saying I'm an expert on it, but you, you get to know some of the recurring imagery. Uh, so this time, as I'm reading the book of Revelation, I'm picking up on all of these images. Oh, well, that's, that's 
what I've read in Amos or oh, that's we've seen this already in Isaiah or Ezekiel is very, very clear uh, in this. Um, so I want to point that out. And I also want to point out that I'm not trying to prove text. Uh, a lot of times, and, and I have, I'm very sensitive about this because I don't like proof text textures, as you might imagine. But, uh, you know, a lot of times people will try to prove a point by, well, you know, this is this, my point is being supported by what it says in Ezekiel. That's not what I'm doing. I think that's fairly clear. What I am doing is, um, looking at all of these vectors, all of these traditions that are impinging upon John at this particular moment in history, around 90 to 100 of the common area era, uh, where the church is really in a bit of a crisis. So at least for John, it's in a bit of a crisis. If you were John at this time, you probably would have seen Paul's church or Paul's theology um, starting to take precedence over uh, what we might call Jewish Christianity. And so there, there's that psychological aspect uh, of John as well. So his, his imagery, his, uh, um, his visions really reach back into the Hebrew Bible and, and in many ways try to, I don't want to say justify, but validate themselves by drawing on this rich tradition. These are symbols that his Jewish audience, his Jewish followers of Jesus, Jewish Christian audience, would have probably recognized in a way that we don't clearly recognize. So um, any, any comments or points of clarification about that that I, I can make? And again, I always welcome the comments, please. Dan, this is Sharon. Yeah, Sharon. I've been trying to keep up with the lectionary the last week or so. And it's really interesting to me how often what you were talking about shows up in, in the Old Testament readings, particularly Isaiah. Right. It's like reading some parts of that that I've never ever understood because there are lots of pronouns that I keep looking back and saying, where did this come from? Who are they talking about? Right. I quite often think about the Book of Watchers and some of that context that you offered. Right. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to mention that today. I'm. We've, we've already looked at this uh, slide, but I'll just remind us uh, where we are because we are gonna reach back into Daniel and the Book of Watchers and all of this is just like this, uh, this storehouse of symbolism that John would have known so well. This is not all being created ex nihilo, you know, uh, out of nothing. Uh, John is, drawing on tradition in a way that's that's very uh very rich for him so well we uh, last time we got to the, oh any other comments before i move on thank you for that sharon will is not with us today so i can't count on him you know jumping in but uh well, last time we got to the point of the uh the fifth trumpet and John is, you know, seeing these angels walk out with trumpets, and uh, this is where the star falls from heaven, uh, a possible reference to Isaiah 14, as we said, and opens up, the, this, this being falling from heaven has a key that opens up the abyss, and last time we talked about how uh, the abyss uh, is really a Greek idea, Hades, for example, uh, we don't get any sense of the abyss until we get uh, Hebrew culture coming into contact with Greek culture after, you know, about the middle of the, or the end of the fourth century BCE. But by this time, as we saw in the summer in our reading of, um, you know, uh, our, our book on, on the afterlife, by this time, the idea of the, the abyss, the idea of Hades is, is fully a part of uh, uh, Jewish theology. And, it, and it's created a lot of uh, controversy, you might say, or a lot of conversation among Jewish rabbis. There are two Jewish groups that are splitting on this whole idea. Is there an afterlife? The Sadducees, nah, no, no afterlife. There's nothing in the books of Moses that say there's an afterlife. But the Pharisees that Jesus was you know, very familiar with, as well as the Essenes who were living in the desert, though having a different view of the afterlife, had a sense of you know uh, the demonic in the world and had a sense of the abyss itself 
So this angel falling from heaven uh, and opening the abyss, uh, we're seeing not only John's Hebraic uh, background, but we're seeing the influence of, of Greek uh, mythology as well. In the Old Testament, the abyss usually referred to as the ocean, you know, the water, the waters of creation and chaos, uh, the waters of chaos at creation. But now it certainly is a place. And there is, uh, you know, uh, there are angels who have been you know, uh, condemned there, as we saw in the Book of Watchers. Uh, but the herds of demonic locusts are set loose upon the world. They destroy uh, for five months, of, in a period of five months, they destroy much of the vegetation, a third of, of the world. Uh, and then we have uh, the sixth trumpet itself. So that's, that's where we were last time. And I wanted to uh, just kind of remind us where we were because it's you know kind of complex. Hard for me to remember all of this. So, any questions or comments about this that I can uh, that we can consider before we move on? Okay. Well, now I'm going to begin reading then at Revelation uh, chapter nine, verses thirteen through nineteen. This is the sixth trumpet that an angel is uh, going to blow. Um, 13 through 19, let me find it. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels were released. The four angels who had been held ready for the hour, the day, and the month, and the year, to kill a third of humankind. Now, now we're getting to brass tacks, aren't we? Not just a third of you know, the grass, but a third of, of humankind. People are dying in this. The number of the troops of caval cavalry was 200 million. I heard their number. And this was how I saw the horses in my vision. The riders wore breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. Uh, fire is red, sapphire is blue, and sulfur is yellow. The heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and the fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of humankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouth and in their tails. Their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they inflict harm. Uh, I'll just read on till the end of the uh, chapter. The rest of humankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands or give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot hear, see, or walk. And they did not repent of their murders or of their sorceries or their fornication or their thefts. Well, now we're getting into fornication and all that good stuff that, you know, that, that uh, people like to draw upon when we get into New Testament, right? Uh, all of these sins, despite these angels being let loose on the world uh, and killing a third of the world, those who remain, now remember, those who do not have the seal of God on their head do not repent, which is not a good idea, you know. Uh, I don't know if, if that's not going to make you repent. These horses with lions' heads and serpents' tails. Uh, what John is trying to emphasize here is just how far gone, how completely immersed in idolatry, the worship of that which is not God or that is which is not pleasing to God, uh, misdirected love. Uh, just how far idolatry has gone as evidenced by, you know, the destruction of, of the world. We talked about Vesuvius, about destruction in nature and destruction in society. Remember those four horsemen of the previous um, vision. The first horseman represented the threat from without. The second horseman, uh, you know, the, the threat from within or internal conflict, the third, you know, it, all of those things, including death, are not causing people to repent. This is how far gone they are. Uh, symb 
symbolic, I think, of, of uh, what we might call uh, human addiction. Um, uh, the, the, probably the most supreme of idolatries is addiction itself. Uh, and that's what John is seeing here. So I'm gonna stop, see any comments here? Then let's get into some of the details. Um, releasing the angels at the Euphrates. Now these are not, this is interesting because we've just seen an angel fall from heaven. And this is something that is about to happen, right? Many people refer to this text, you know, the fifth trumpet uh, as, you know, uh, evidence of this, this myth about, you know, the angels having a battle in heaven. And of course, and Michael and Gabriel kicking out the angels and uh, something that Milton did quite, uh, you know, Milton spent a lot of time on with, you know, uh, Paradise Lost and uh, not so much Paradise Regained. But these angels, like the angel who was in the abyss, are not good angels. They have been, uh, they have been bound at the Euphrates for them. Now, this is reflective of the four angels that we saw in the uh, previously that uh, were, were being held back from unleashing, you know, the hailstorm and, and fire from heaven. And, and, and they're not the same angels. Uh, these are, they're reflective of it, you know, the number four. But these angels and their placement is very, very important because the colors that John refers to the Euphrates was the eastern end of the Roman Empire uh, and was always giving people uh, problems. Uh, remember that first horseman, the, you know, the threat from without? Uh, the Parthians uh, were always giving the Romans fits and it was the Parthian cavalry, which was, you know, hell on wheels. Uh, I don't think we have a good... Uh, I don't think we have a good analogy for it, but you know, it, think about the fear that we had in the 50s and 60s of nuclear weapons, you know, and we all had to get under deaths and things like that. Uh, that was the the Parthian cavalry was the nuclear weapon of uh, you know the first century that John was referring to, and you know, a cavalry has maybe a thousand in it, but John here tries to augment and emphasize just how overwhelming this, you know, this uh, destruction is going to be. He uses the term myriad. The term in, in the Greek and uh, the Greek language is the largest number uh, that conceivable, 10,000. What John does, he, he multiplies 10,000 by 10,000, comes up with 100 million, then doubles it. So in other words, we're talking about a, an overwhelming and infinite amount of cavalry people on the level of uh, the, um, uh, the Parthian, uh, the Par Parthian cavalry as well. So, um, and to give a sense of just how completely corrupt uh, creation has become, the, uh, the judgment of creation comes from demonic creatures who are equally as corrupt. Uh, you've got a horse with the head of a lion breathing fire and sulfur. Fire and sulfur are often referred to as brimstone, you know, fire and brimstone uh, uh, in the Old Testament. But this is judgment. This, these are images of judgment. Um, and I remember somebody also uh, mentioning to me when we were talking about this, it, you know, that fire and sulfur also may refer to a kind of a false speech or propaganda that uh, the Romans were obviously so good at, you know. Um, and I thought how relevant that is for us today, you know, the so-called fake news or, or prop propaganda uh, and, and the way it can corrupt people's minds. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that at all. But I did like that connection between, you know, these these uh, malformed creatures breathing propaganda and, and false speech. speech. Um, but again, humanity's response persisting in their idolatry. There's a very interesting word here that I'd like to get your uh, opinion on. Uh, 
it doesn't come clear, come through as clearly in the, uh, in the English translation, but I'll read it again, uh, starting at verse 20. The rest of humankind who were not killed by these plagues, two thirds of the earth, did not repent of the works of their hands or give up worshiping demons and idols and gold of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or talk. That's reminiscent of Paul, right? Actually, um, Pastor Greg's sermon this Sunday talked about uh, in Corinth, Christians who were, you know, uh, mature in the faith knew that, you know, the, the idols that meat was sacrificed to, food was sacrificed to, were just simply wood, you know, and bronze and gold. They, they, they didn't have any real referent. And so worship of those idols was out of ignorance. So eating food sacrificed to them, you know, the food is, there's nothing wrong with that food. However, if you are going to cause a weaker Christian uh, to falter in his or her faith by eating that food, then, you know, be aware of your communal responsibility. Um, this is reminiscent of Paul here, right? Those idols are nothing, you know, they're just, they're just material objects that people have become addicted to, that misdirect their love towards. Uh, and they did not repent. The people remained. They did not repent of their murders or their sorceries. And this is a, this is a word which is, has been used by uh, people in recent debates. The word is pharmacon, their medicines. Uh, their special herbs. Uh, some have suggested, and of course, uh, we're, we're going to talk about the abortion debate right now. Abortion was practiced in uh, the ancient world, usually as, you know, through a mixture of herbs or certain types of what we might call emetics, you know, that are used to purge. Uh, there is no reference in the New Testament or in the Old Testament for that matter that I can, uh, I can think of uh, to abortion. There is in a, a text that um, is, is called uh, the Didache, which was uh, written early on in the church as kind of a, a manual of how to be a church, right? And there it condemns the idea of abortion. And ab abortion was usually practiced by pharmaceutical means. And so this word pharmacon, we think of, it's been translated in the Revised Standard Version as sorceries, but it, it literally refers to potions. People who try to use scripture to support the idea that uh, you know, abortion is prohibited by scripture. Uh, this is the problem when, you, when you're a very a literalist, when something you want to support literally is not there in scripture, well, then you have to make inference. And the inference here is that these sorceries that John is referring to, this pharmacon, are the, uh, uh, the potions that are being used to abort uh, children. Um, it's, a, it's a very far-fetched argument, but it's one that is made. So I thought, you know, without us getting into the whole issue of abortion here and whether it appears or doesn't appear in, uh, in scripture, I just thought I would uh, give you opportunity to, to ask a question about that or make a comment. Anybody? So I didn't say hello to Penny. I'm curious about, I'm sorry. I, I was on a, two conferences this morning and I was starving. So I just had to get something to eat, I'm sorry. Um, and on what what were the warrants used in the Didache? I'm not from the I've read parts of it, but what are the warrants used in the Didache to prohibit or advise against abortion? It just it just it you know the Didache was used um, as a uh, a manual to prepare people for their baptism. Right. At this time, you know, uh, preparation for becoming baptized in the church was an, a year long event, and it lent people would, uh, uh, who were going to be baptized at Easter, uh, the church would fast with those, uh, you know, uh, catechum catechumens uh, who were, were uh, about to um, you know, be baptized. 
over 40 days. Uh, but in the Didache, it gives a list of uh, what we might call uh, acts or uh, uh, attitudes that were immoral. And in that long list is the reference to abortion. Uh, and so it, 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 it's just simply kind of a one-off, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, don't abort, you know, on down the line. So it's not really, um, uh, it's not really elaborated on, but it is mentioned, uh, which is kind of ironic because it's not mentioned in the New Testament. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure how much they understood about the part that women played in uh, begetting children. That is, uh, I can remember a story of uh, the man who spread his seed on the ground yeah. instead of, uh, and um, I've forgotten the name of the uh, character, but there's that explicit, uh, that gets the disapproval of God in that case. Right. And uh, I don't remember it in uh, women because I'm not sure they understood that uh, women uh, produce an egg or anything of that sort. Well, you know, there is such a high uh, respect for women in the Old Testament, New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> facetious. No, I mean, but we know from we know from Aristotle that uh, uh, it was believed that in in male semen there was a little tiny man, and what the women, woman did was just simply provide the uh, you know the environment for that uh, mm -hmm. for, for that uh, fetus to, to grow. The woman was just a placeholder. It's where we get the idea of a bun in the <laughs> oven. The, the woman's just an oven, right? Well, we know that that. You know that's certainly not the case, but apparently what the, these pharmacon or these uh, sorceries, these potions tried to do is to somehow corrupt the oven, lower the temperature or whatever you might say, uh, to, uh, you know, I guess to uh, promote or to uh, cause uh, the child to be uh, born through miscarriage. Uh, and that, and it was clear that by the, the Roman era, the people were practicing this. Um, and it's, you know, it's just uh, part of the, uh, part of the interpretation of, of Revelation that I think I, I thought I would bring some uh, reference to, because there's a lot here that, you know, it's not part of uh, the church that we, that we know of quite well. Uh, for example, the, um, for dis dispensationalism, we'll talk about actually in the next uh, next chapter. Um, any other comments about this? Well, I, I would just like to say um, I've been doing some reading uh, about what was uh -huh. going on in the Middle Ages, and they were doing the same thing. Uh, the sad thing, I mean, it's sad. I mean, let's be honest, the whole thing is sad, but this pharmacon, uh, the, the people that were giving these poisons out is what they really were, yeah. were warning the women, you know, you could die. Right. Uh, that was the danger of it. It wasn't, you, you, you wouldn't just necessarily abort your child, but you could die. Yeah. And I think that's one of the concerns or, or the, the thing that intrigues Penny about this. I don't want to speak for you, Penny, but the, the idea, all right, well, it says don't abort. Well, well, why? Is it because of what Gene is saying? Because you, you yourself could die? Or is it because, you know, they believe that the child was a human being? Um, now, I, I don't know this for certain, but I've, I've heard that in the Jewish tradition, a child doesn't become a human being until you know, uh, several days out of the womb. So well, it actually, I think the quickening is another criteria, I think, for reformed right. Jews. Yeah. When I, I you actually that's... feel the child kicking. Yeah. But maybe yeah. that's not reformed Judaism. I, I, it's all laid out very well in one of my professor's texts that does, yeah. she looks at the history of abortion. So I, I'll check it out. So yeah. Can... Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to make this about abortion, but I do want people to know that, you know, um, when people try to, when theologians try to, emphasize their anti-abortion stance, uh, they will often proof text as many evangelicals try to do. And it's really hard to do uh, literally if you're a literalist uh, reading the Bible. So this is one of the places where they will draw on a, on a proof text. Well, what he's referring to there are these pharmacon that these uh, women, women were using, uh, not the case. 
uh, what John is doing is creating this list of um, uh, activities that were usually associated, it was all associated with idolatry. Uh, uh, sorceries could be things like, you know, trying to tell the future. Uh, fornication uh, in the New Testament, fornication is usually associated with uh, worship of another god. Uh, it, it, you know, you know how uh, the, the prophet Isaiah, uh, excuse me, the prophet Hosea, uh, God called on Hosea to go out and marry a prostitute uh, just so that Hosea could demonstrate to the Israelites how God felt. You know, here's this priest, a pure, you know, man uh, being called to, to, you know, to have children with a prostitute. Well, it's just like the Israelites who are going to um, uh, these pagan temples and worshiping, they are, um, they are committing adultery against God. So fornication in our Puritan, <laughs> our Puritan uh, influenced uh, culture usually has to do with sexual morality. But in the New Testament, it's usually associated with some sort of idolatry and, and paganism. So, uh, and so John is drawing this clear distinction. Who's, who's going to be the ones to suffer in this? Well, the pagans, the, the pagans are. All of those who are practicing uh, those things that are uh, prohibited by the true love of God. Um, Before you go on, I'm sorry. Yeah, Before go ahead, Ken. I'm just curious, there's so many times my, my, I don't have a detailed understanding of West medicine and Western history, but so often people would prescribe potions, shall we say, and that's happening now in the alternative health world, right. where people are saying, don't follow what the doctor said, here's my new drug using these, or my new liquid using these two rare yeah. <laughs> things that we derive from the natural world, and it's all natural, you know, yeah, so... Yeah. Drinking potions or eating eating things made of potions or whatever, is this a narrow reading of pharma, Pharmacon? Or does Pharmacon also include all of these types of things? Well, um, I, I think that's, that's why uh, the Revised Standard Version put the word sorceries in there. Um, now, remember also, this is one of the things that the angels called the watchers the result of the angels falling in love with human women and uh, cavorting with them, having you know, relations with them, what, what resulted from that? Well, the angels taught them how to use all kinds of sorceries, right? All kinds of how to, to make things from herbs and, and things that are often you know, today so associated with witchcraft. Uh, they also taught them how to make weapons and how to uh, um, uh, do metallurgy, all of those things that uh, we would not have known about otherwise had those angels not, you know, turned away from their uh, their um, responsibility to God. So this comes from the Book of Watchers, you know, written probably around the second century uh, BCE. Um, so, but Penny, more to the point, I think the reason the RSV uses super, uh, you know, these um, uh, what is the word, you know, sorceries is because, because of this broader definition. The point I'm trying to make is those who want to make it very specific will say that this pharmacon refers to these, you know, these drugs that were used for abortion purposes. So any other comments uh, about this? Love this conversation we're having. I didn't say hello to Lynn. Hello, Lynn, how are you? And Rich, good, and Anne. We started without you, sorry. <laughs> so, well, let's... Um, Let's Dan? get into the third Russian doll. We're, we're... Uh, Dan? Yeah, go ahead, Denny. Real quick, real yeah. quick. Uh, it's really fascinating how culture defines who is in, who, when does human life begin? Right. And in Africa, for example, uh, particularly in West Africa, uh, new, well, baby, babies are not named until they are 12 months old and therefore they are not considered uh, full human beings. Right, and right. It's the exact opposite of people saying at the point of you know, conception in the, in the US among certain individuals. So it, 
culture is such a such a major force in defining things right. that people just take for granted. I like that idea of uh, not naming a child until he or she is 12 months old. And Native Americans do this, actually, except some uh, Native American cultures do this. And, and allow a child to, to change his or her name several times in the lifespan. Um, but if it's, you know, what we do is we ascribe a name and it's usually something that's, uh, you know, arbitrary. Ah, as, as long as we've been teaching, you know, there was a time when I was teaching when I couldn't throw an eraser in the classroom and not hit a Sarah or a Megan or a Katie. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Those names are everywhere. And then Brittany became a big one, you know. So, uh, but we just choose a name and kind of fling it at the child even before it's born. But what they do in West Africa, 12 months allows that child to present his character or her character so that uh, the child's uh, personality lends itself to um, re revealing his name instead of ascribing a name, you know, kind of objectively as we do. Um, and Dan, Dan, yeah, go ahead. Um, in, the, in certain Native American cultures, the, when a person is like, you know, 13 or 14, he goes on a vision quest and right. it is revealed to him what his name ought to be. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've had adolescents and they don't really become human until they're 16. <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> 16, you're being very generous. <laughs> oh, listen, well, you know what Mark Twain said, when a kid is 12, you put him in a barrel and feed him through a knot hole. And when he's 16, you close up the knot hole. <laughs> Boy, have I ever wanted to do that with my vacation. <laughs> well, but, but this question of, you know, when do we become human is, is very important. If we define human as individuals, uh, you know, then it's conceivable that at conception, there is an individual that's been created. But if we define humans as part of an interdependent, interconnected web, then the more you become part of your living community, the more human you become, right? Um, and so- You get a driver's license. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> then you become independent, right? Um, but, but that, that is what fuels, you know, our insights into the abortion debate, and um, and so. But that's a topic for another time. Um, but thank you for bringing that up because the whole issue, Denny, of of naming. Uh, I was named after my dad. I'm a junior, though I never put junior after my name. And I don't. I think if I could have chosen my name, it would not be the name that my that that reflected my father's name, right? And so. But let's move on. Uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 7. Remember our Russian doll uh, uh, analogy here. We're about to be introduced to the third Russian doll. Uh, but what's going to happen is there's going to be an interlude before that happens, as there was an interlude before John's second uh, string of visions. Um, so let me just start reading from chapter 10, verses 1 through 7. And I saw another mighty angel coming down from heavens, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. He held a little scroll open in his hand, setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. He gave a great shout like a lion roaring. And when he shouted, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Uh, then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is to blow his trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled as he announced to his servants and the prophets. So we're about on it. Uh, the fulfillment of God's time and, and God's judgment is about to begin. Um, this, by the way, this is a, a William Blake uh, rendering of, of this idea, the seven, the, the mighty angel his right foot on the sea and his left foot on land. And 
and John down here below at a you know particularly interesting vantage point uh, to look up at the angel. But thankfully, he is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, he is, he's modestly clad, as as all Christian art tends to, uh, <laughs> tends to reflect. But the thing I wanted to show you here is this little scroll, this little scroll, and um, in his hand, in his left hand. Um, a lot of scholars have debated as to whether or not this is a different scroll than the one that we've just been talking about. You know, with the writing on both sides and the seven seals and everything. And it, it rests upon uh, this distinction between two Greek words. The word for book in Greek is biblion, it's where we get our word Bible from, and biblioteca in, in Spanish for library. Um, and then a, a diminutive form of that is called is biblaridion, or little book. Uh, now, why would John use two different words for the same scroll. Uh, is he talking about another scroll here? Well, scholars go back and forth on this, but there are other instances where John is referring to, or where Greek authors are referring to scrolls by the same word, Biblaridion and Biblion. Uh, so we shouldn't assume here that this is a different scroll. The scroll is, is persisting uh, throughout uh, this, uh, uh, this vision. And, it, and it's actually one of the things that connects these visions uh, together. So we're not talking about a different scroll. Uh, and that's important because uh, we want to maintain the continuity between all these visions. So uh, this mighty angel, even though this is a little interlude, is also uh, maintaining a continuity throughout the book of Revelation. This most likely is the mighty angel that, ref that uh, appears to John at the beginning of his, his, um, uh, his visions in chapter one. Uh, the mighty angel is referred to again, who tells him at the beginning of John's second vision, behold the lamb, you know, the lamb who's coming, who's worthy to open the scroll. Now this mighty angel is, is showing up again. So it's almost like he's opening the door to our third little, you know, uh, Russian doll. Uh, uh, but some of the references here uh, uh, reflect his authority. Uh, these ideas, uh, this idea of the lion's roar. Uh, this is a reference that's often made uh, to God. And let me see if I can find this quickly. In Amos, Amos often refers to uh, the lion and the lion's roar as representative of the, the day of judgment. He, he calls it the day of the Lord. In fact, it's Amos who really comes up with this idea that, you know, what the people up to that time had been waiting for is to God to show his glory and to show his, uh, uh, now this would have been the eighth century, uh, God to show his glory and God, eighth century BCE, uh, to show his favor to the uh, Israelites. But Amos says, you're waiting for that day of the Lord, you're wrong. It's going to be like you're running away from a lion and you run into a bear. Uh, it's, it's not going to be a day that you're, you're going to be looking forward to. And the lion is one who will tear you to pieces. And, and of course, the lion's roar here in Revelation probably is drawing upon this imagery from, from Amos. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? And so John is going to hear here the lion of God, the, the lion's roar, and he's going to be called upon to prophesy. You know, there's a new prophecy that we're going to give to you. Um, and I unfortunately won't have time to get to that prophecy, but the seven thunders also uh, reflective of uh, the voice of God. And uh, this, this idea is, is found see if I can find Psalms very quickly. Psalm 29 uh, refers to the voice of God and the power of God. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Um, see if I can find where the, the thunder is here. Ah, uh, oh, here it is. 
The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Um, the voice of the Lord thundering over mighty waters is most likely a reference to God in the beginning who creates out of chaos order, but can also, you know, also has to, the power to, to turn it back into chaos, right? And so this is a, you know, an allusion to uh, the God of creation who is about to bring to fulfillment his creation, the God's creation. Um, and um, if I can remember, get back to Revelation here, a time of no more delay. Darn it, I lost my place. Um, down below, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is to blow his trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Uh, we're, we're already in the midst, of, according to John, we're already in the midst of uh, this tribulation. And then we talked about this, uh, uh, this distress that was gonna come upon the world. And you might remember in our previous classes, we talked about Daniel. Uh, in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel's divided up into a legendary set of chapters. And then there's these apocalyptic chapters. And Daniel makes this prediction that uh, a time and two times and a half a time, literally is what he <laughs> says, is going to transpire between the beginning of a great distress, Daniel 12, 1, and the fulfillment of God's uh, fulfillment of God's uh, plan. Let me see if I can find this as well really quickly. You will remember it because this is what, oh darn it, I've lost it. This is what the dispensationalists often, often refer to. Um, Daniel 12, 1. Um, at that time, he's talking about the coming of the end. The, Michael, the great prince, the angel, the protector of your people shall arise there shall be a time of anguish such, a, such as has never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Recall here the name on the forehead that, that uh, John has re referring to, those who are marked by the sign of God on the forehead. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting uh, contempt. Here, the first reference and perhaps the only reference in the Hebrew Bible, or at least the Protestant Hebrew Bible, to resurrection. This Daniel probably would have been written around the third of the second century when the idea of resurrection, we talked about this in our summer book, you know, that those would be, people would be resurrected bodily and judged. This is what Daniel is referring to here. Those who are wise shall shine like, shine like the brightness of the sun, and those who, who uh, led many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, keep the word secret and the book sealed until the time of the end. Not unlike what John is being asked to do here, right? The, what you're hearing in the seven thunders seven, the number of perfection, what you're hearing in the voice of God, don't write that down. That that's, needs to remain secret, right? So Daniel heard some, or excuse me, John, easy to get them mixed up. John heard something here uh, that is still being held secret, that we, we have no uh, idea of, of what it is. Then I, Daniel, looked and, and, and two others appeared, one standing on this bank on the stream and one on the other. Okay, eventually we're going to see that John is going to come into the presence of two witnesses. Uh, and you probably know this when we get into chapter, uh, chapter 11. Uh, but the, the similarities here with Daniel's vision is very interesting. One of them said to the man clothed in linen who was upstream, how long shall it be until the end of these wonders? The man clothed in limit, linen who was upstream, uh, raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. And I heard him say, swear by the one who lives forever that it would be for a time, two times, 
and a half a time. Now here's where our dispensationalist friends, you know, we don't know exactly what this word time means. A time could be 10,000 years, it could be, you know, but dispensationalists believe that this refers to a year. A time is a year, two times is two years, and a half a time is a half a year. So extrapolating from what we've just read from Daniel, recognizing the uh, similarity between this vision that John is having in the first century and what Daniel has uh, you know, written in the second century BC, third or second century BCE, uh, the dispensationalists will take this and say, this time of great distress will be three and a half years. That's what Daniel said. That's what John is alluding to here. Um, and it's going to be after this time of tribulation that God's, um, it, you know, God's uh, uh, plan is going to be fulfilled. Add to that something that comes from, uh, I think it's Second Thessalonians. Can't re I always get mixed up if it's first or second. Uh, the rapture, right? Uh, there will be some is second. Okay, thank you, Penny. There will be some who are taken up and others who will be left behind, right? We know the story. Some who will be taken up, but those who are left behind will endure this three and a half years of, of tri tribulation. They're the ones that still have the mar marking of God on their foreheads. Is Lest I give you the impression that this dispensationalist uh, perspective is what John is trying to get across. I'm not saying that. I'm trying to give you a sense of how dispensationalists reason their way into uh, their, um, uh, you know, their theology. So um, very, very interesting. Uh, and unfortunately, we, our time is almost upon us. Uh, don't, uh, we're about to hear the second or the seventh uh, trumpet blast which is going to announce the day of the Lord. Now, uh, we've already seen that this is about to happen. It's, it's not necessarily at the end of the three and a half years. The time of delay, uh, the, the delay is no longer, you know, we're, it's about to happen. And what I wanna talk about next time, and, I, and before I get into it now, I'll just introduce it and we can get into it next time. We've seen how John has drawn upon the imagery of Daniel in the next set of verses. And I will read them just so we know where we're going. Uh, let, me, let me find Revelation again. <laughs> Popping back and forth in the Bible. A lot of fun. Just so we know where we're going, I'm going to read uh, this new prophetic uh, vision or commission that John has. Chapter uh, 10, verses 8 through 11. Uh, then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will be bitter to your <laughs> stomach, but sweet as honey in your mouth. So I took the little scroll, Bibliridion here again, the little scroll. Um, uh, from the hand of the angel, and I ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. Then they said to me, this they, then they said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Now, what might be nice for you to do in our, the time remaining between now and next week, uh, reread, or if you haven't read for the first time, reread Ezekiel chapters, well, beginning at chapter two, verse nine, all the way to about the first 10 verses of chapter three. Uh, chapter one's a doozy. This is Ezekiel's image of the, the wheels that are turning in the sky, but then he is met by an angel. He's referred to as son of man, right? And the angel says, I want you to eat this. Uh, it tastes like honey, but it's also going to be bitter. This is almost exactly what John is referring to here, but there's a big difference. 
And that's going to be the thing that's most intriguing for us that I hope that we can get into uh, next week. So um, I've talked a lot. Is, has anybody been trying to get in to say anything? Okay, I'm looking through the, the list of folks here. Folks, this for me is one of the great joys of my week. <laughs> I really enjoy this time. I really enjoy the, you know, um, I guess the, the, the inducement <laughs> to study uh, Revelation uh, again and to, you know, really dive into it. You know, when you read any book of the Bible, you're always reading it from your uh, situation in life. And uh, uh, this has been very rewarding for me to do this because Dan, uh, John in many ways is, is putting together a patchwork quilt, I see, of, of, um, of the Old Testament or of, of the prophecies that uh, we've been reading for the last two years. And it's all coming together and making sense to me at least. I hope it is in some ways to you. Would anybody like to say anything before we leave? Thank you. Well, yes, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being uh, great students. Thank you. Dan, do you have a minute that I could just talk to you or do you have to rush off to a meeting? No, or I've got to meet. If you want to talk about uh, 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 power and light stuff, that'd be great, uh, Penny. Okay. So, so everybody else can clock out and I'm going to stay <laughs> online and talk to Penny. So thanks, thank you. Everyone. Thanks, Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye